resources for freelance projects. And it's this one, the agdacontract.idml, that's the one you want. Uh, now on there I'll just point out that there are some other examples there you might want to download just to have a look at how other students have done them. Um, you know, it's always handy to look at them. Um, and this one too, the short design contract example, we can have a look at that. Um, so they're useful things for you to look at. Da, 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 da. Uh, and this one too is also from a student. So you could download those just to have a look. So I've got Ryan's up on screen now. Um, so you'll see that the document, the IDML document I'm giving is quite um, long. And the idea is that you edit it out so that you end up with something more like this and you only put in the things that are necessary. Um, the stages of work, whatever you decide to call these stages of work, that's what I want you to make sure when you invoice the client, you use the same terminology. So whatever you've decided to put in here, those headings, this is the stages of work, you need to replicate that. So you need to actually make sure, then the client knows, oh yeah, that's right, I've agreed in the contract that I'll just get two final designs. That's what I agreed on and that's what I'm being charged for. So it's really clear to everybody. So if you use different terms in here and then change it on the invoice, then you'll get questions. What, what do you mean? What's this extra charge here? What, what's that for? So to avoid that, just be really clear. Um, there's items to be produced, oh, there's a spelling mistake there, but items. So again, that's what you've agreed to actually produce. Commencement of work. Now these terms and conditions, I'm going to go through them a little bit um, because you don't need to adapt them very much, but there's a few places where you might want to. And then there's a signature at the bottom. So you can see that neatly goes down to, you know, just two pages. So it doesn't have to be extensive and long. Um, but let's have a look at the actual um, template. So if you could all just open the template now and then you can save time by instead of just watching me do this, do it as I'm doing it and just fill in the things that relate to your particular client. So open the IDML contract and then you can ask questions as we go along rather than going home and trying to remember what we said in class. So the contract we're using is it's the AGDA, the Australian Graphic Design Association template. So it basically means you can be pretty sure that the um, legal terms set out there are pretty good. It's designed for designers rather than having to go and pay uh, a lawyer and set them up from scratch. There are a number of products out there you can have a look at, but you know that the AGDA one is you know, written for Australian law as well, so that's also a good thing. Sorry, mine's just taking forever to open. Okay, so everybody should have it open on the screen and just edit it as we go along. So we should be able to get this done first half of lesson and the second half we just will be doing the business plan and we'll do the same kind of thing. Sorry, really it's taking forever. Everybody's getting plenty of time to open theirs. My mind's dragging.
Hopefully it's going to open in a minute. Here we go, finally. Sorry, I'm just going to have no idea what this thing thinks it's doing. Here we go. So, finally, zoom up on this. Oh my god. Okay, so this is a draft cover leather of the first page. So, this is quite a good model. Uh, to follow as well. So, it, you know, we've been talking about writing emails, so sometimes you're doing this via email. So this is not a bad model. So fill that in. The client is obviously whoever you're doing it for. So in red are the things that you've got to change. So further to our last meeting, so you put the date that you've talked to them uh, when you first initially talked to them about the project and then what's the name of the project. So what you're going to be providing them is, this is very typical, an outline of the work, an estimate of the time and fees, and the terms and conditions. Blah, blah, blah. So just put in red, replace the red with your particular project name. And so what is the project? So, come on guys, fill it in. Do it now, because you know, I'm hounding you, because why go home and do this all over again? <laughs> Just fill it in as we go and it will be done. So the, what's the purpose of the project name? What, what's the project called? And what is it? Is it to make a brochure? What is it? So the pur purpose of your freelance job you're doing with a client is to what? Make a t-shirt design? Make a logo? What is the actual thing you're producing for them? Um, this next sentence, among the key issues that we'll need to take into consideration are, and uh, this could be anything they've told you about um, the number of colours, it could be something they've told you about the audience. It's generally a place where you can um, reconfirm any of the things you talked about that were really important. So it might be something like one of the key issues is that it must appeal to um, <clears throat> to the um, audience between you know 20 and 25 or it, it, it must be um, family friendly you know so think about some of the things that were in the TAFE brief so it had to be family friendly events it had to be um, include the TAFE um, uh, logo so it might be any of those kind of things but really there may be something really important they said to you it might be something like, please avoid using orange. I don't know. What did they say to you? What was most important to them? One or two things that they really emphasised when you met with them. Therefore, our design solution will um, appeal to that particular audience uh, or be so suitable for print and social media. What were the, some of the parameters? So it is a sort of a, a very shortened restatement of what they ask you to do. Again, really clarifying what you've been told to do. If you're unsure, put something there and then when I come around, you can just double check with me, is that the kind of thing? So, um, it's critical considerations. What's super important? There might be many considerations, but there was something really emphasised, one or two factors really emphasised by the client in your first meeting. Then we get to the stages of work. So I showed you that model of Ryan's. 
um, this is you you make up the words what do you want to call the concept development um, now when you get sort of further into it you might even put in here that there's an initial consultation fee and they have to deliver um, you know money to you first before you'll begin so that's that's actually something to think about particularly if there's a website involved I know um, that a lot of website developers and website designers would demand 50% up front before beginning the project. And then you know you see your client is serious about it. Are you still allowed to demand that much up front? It's a business decision. As a um, like trades person, you're only allowed to ask for 10% before starting. As a sole trader, you would stick to the 10% up front. Yeah, okay. But once you're doing business over 70000 a year, okay. That's when that's what I say, like a, a small web developer or web business, they often ask for quite a lot up front. Yeah. So as a sole trader, you could ask 10%. Mm -hmm. um, that would be up to you. At this stage, a lot of you might leave that out of the contract, uh, especially if you're doing voluntary work. But it's, a, it's something to think about further down the track. Remember here, we're trying to give you a taste of, well, What's it like to actually work and have a number of freelance jobs I'm managing? And for a lot of you guys, you'll be aiming to get a full-time job, but you still might do some freelance business on the side. And again, you want to make sure that you're not getting ripped off and that your, your client is happy. So this is a good way of developing those skills. So do you want to call then? then in that case, if you're not having a consultation fee, delete it. So you should be deleting anything that's not relevant to this particular job. So the typical stages of any design, there'll be some sort of concept development, and um, but you could call this initial, you know, initial stage, something like that. Up to you what to call what you call it, as long as you use the same term on your invoice. So this stage involves research, references, talking to the client, design development. So. Remember the things you sent to me? Those initial sketches, initial ideas, mood boards. Um, so at this point, you're just getting to the very first initial designs. So you could say in here um, that you'll provide them with two initial mood boards for, for, to help communicate. So you reword this to suit your design process. So you're going to decide what happens in that initial stage. So emailing backwards and forwards with initial design to establish the initial design direction, that's what this is all about. The next stage, um, now it talks about presentation dummies, so you might want to take that out and that's kind of refers, it's an old, probably an old fashioned term now when you used to make physical dummies, although in some instances for a complex folding system uh, for something you probably would make a blank dummy and discuss it and show it to the client in person. So um, you could just say you're going to provide, you know, um, design development PDFs, you know, so adjust it. So don't just stick with this because it might, won't make sense for your particular job. So you've got to reword it and a lot of this you might delete and just put in your own words. What exactly? you're going to put. So a working dummy is really just your design ideas and you're looking for feedback, but they're more finished than sketches and roughs and mood boards. By this stage, you've actually got a direction you've agreed on and you're now looking at some design ideas going backwards and forwards and starting to go down one direction. Um, now, I've put this in bold because most people would not agree to this. It says there's no limit on the number of working dummies that will be generated. Um, I would delete that and say how many of these development designs will you send to them. So with the Tay Freelance one, you've been sending me two or three sketches, that's initial development, and now I'm asking you for one or two more fully developed designs in in Illustrator slash Photoshop um, to show me. So put a limitation in there. I do not agree with this. I would never leave that in a contract. 
uh, you could be there forever. Honestly, you know, you, uh, if, if, if the client points to that and says, oh, but, but I'm not happy, oh, I'm going to sit, can we do some more? I'm not, still not happy. You'll never end. It's terrible. So um, I don't agree with that. <laughs> so these are really draft designs. You could, you call, you could, if you want to be clear about that, you could call it draft designs. Um, up to you again, like, remember that we're developing your business documents here. So I'm gonna, not going to dictate exactly what you should put in here. You know, get some terminology in there that you think you'll understand and they'll understand exactly what's meant by that. But we are talking about draft designs. Yeah, so those are the ones that you're sending. They're in Illustrator or, or Photoshop. They're looking really close to a finished design. They're not initial sketches and mood boards. That was the earlier stage. Now we're looking at one, hopefully one agreed design direction, and you're showing some variations on that direction. Okay, now the next bit, again, you might take that straight out if you're not um, putting any photography in there and you're not being asked to go and do any illustration. Or um, what's more common is that say you're putting a brochure together. So I'll give you an example that I had to do for a big exhibition. They wanted a really comprehensive um, brochure with exploded diagrams of, of this, um, this set. And it had to be an exploded diagram. You know, as the person running and, you know, being the art director, you're not going to sit down and do the exploded diagram, even if you could. That's, that's really detailed work. Um, and there were a number of other illustrations. We agreed on a style. I took them to the Jackie Winter illustration website, chose a, an illustrator, and then we commissioned the, an illustrator who could do the technical exploded diagrams but also had a nice illustration style for the other parts of the brochure. And so that was a commissioned piece. So I did the organising for it. So that takes time. Even though I'm not doing the illustrations, it takes time to organise it. So you would leave that in. The same thing if you've been asked to take the photos yourself, could be, if, if you have those skills. But more likely you'll be spending time going to an image library and sourcing suitable imagery and buying them for the client. <clears throat> so you have to keep track of those expenses. Um, with the commissioning and illustration, um, particularly if you're doing it as a freelancer, I would get the client to pay for that directly, right? So that could be quite costly if there's a lot of illustrations. So you wouldn't want to be paying out of your money, paying the illustrator, then hoping to get it back from the client. And again, you can put that in this section. You can say um, cost of illustrations, blah, 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 to be billed directly to the client. You say. With stock images, um, I've usually just kept, paid for them as I've gone and then just charged the client for those stock images plus some extra, obviously, for the time it takes to actually go and do that sourcing and figuring out, you know, you've got skill involved in that. You've got to figure out the right resolution and also you're in charge of making sure you've got the right copyright usage. So when you go to an image library, you'll see there's different levels of usages and you pay more um, for outright copyright rather than a more limited copyright. So if it's just a one-off in a, in a brochure and you don't care if the business down the road uses the same photo, then you're not, you're not sort of asking for complete rights to it. You don't mind. You're not asking for exclusive rights to that image. Once you want exclusive rights, it costs a little more. And again, you're the person talking to the client about what they want for that. So if you've found a signature image and it's going to really help build the identity of the, be a major part of the branding for a company, then obviously they want exclusive rights to that because otherwise their competitor could go and get the same image, right? So that's where you've got to think and talk and there's time involved in that. So you might be putting a charge and see how it says covers all liaison and creative work done in conjunction with the photographer, blah, blah, blah. 
Now, sometimes you actually have to spend time writing a brief for a photographer uh, or writing a brief for the illustrator. So I had to write a brief for the illustrator in that brochure I'm talking about, briefing them in detail about the kind of exploded diagrams we wanted, how many, and the other illustrations in the brochure. So it was quite an extensive brief for the illustrator. It took quite a bit of time. So you want to be paid for that. Yes, you got a question? Yeah, I'm sure this happens like quite early within the more production Yes. Like, assume yes. like you come across some sort of better image and you want to add it on to the cost. I'm sure you just email the client or something. So like, oh, it will cost a little bit more, but if you should like... Well, you have things that are agreed to in this contract. And then when we get down to the terms and conditions, you'll see there's an extra work part. And that's where you would add on anything that wasn't agreed to in the original contract. Yep, so if you find that an extra 10 images were needed, they weren't agreed to in the contract, then okay. But as long as you have a stage, you know, the amount of imagery and how many photos, obviously that's going to be on the invoice. So it's a billable item. Yeah, so it could expand or contract as long as you have a clear um, item here for it. Um, so final production, that's when you actually sign over and give them the actual um, files, the production files. So up until this point, you haven't given them any production files. So here, you do the final preparation, so preparing print files and making sure everything's been proofread by the client. You've had somebody proofread it and they've signed off on a final version of the design. So it's the final sign off. Once they sign off on that and say yes, ready to go to production, if there's a spelling error or something that they missed, because you've sent it to them to check and they've signed off on it and you, you get a signature on it, so it's the final artwork you sent them, it's a PDF, they can sign it, they can do a digital signature to say yes, I approve this, this is correct, everything is correct, please go ahead and produce it. If they discover a spelling error after that and when it comes back from the printer or something was missed, you're covered. They might come back to you and say, I want a reprint, but you go, hang on, you check this, you had it proofread, I proofread it to the best of my ability, but then I sent it to you to do a final check, you approved the production, I'm sorry, no reprinting. Oh, if yes, we can do a reprint at your cost, but that's not part of the contract, right? So, so this is a really important thing to understand that you're giving the actual files to them. This is the point at which you're transferring the copyright to them as well. You're giving the actual thing that they'll then own to them. Okay, so print supervision. Um, okay, if you're not doing any printed work, then take it out. Don't have it there. So what does that mean? Um, that just means that you've gone and had to spend time getting quotes from usually three different printers. Um, and also, this is also which covers your time in uh, checking for the actual printing. So you can actually go to the printer and get a one-off through the press and you check it. It's called a, a press check where you actually go there and check it on the premises. And that way, if the ink coverage isn't great or you're not unhappy with something, there's a chance to say something to the printer. So you're probably not going to be doing this unless it's a pretty big job uh, that you would bother to go actually down to the printer. Um, what I would say about this is that you make sure that it's clear. This is supervision only. So this is you talking to the printer, liaising, it's the time it takes you to do all of those things that you're charging for. Notice that you're supervising the printing, you're not paying for it. So as with commissioning an illustrator, um, further down the contract you'll see it's very, you make it very clear that um, they pay the printer directly rather than you as a small design agency or freelancer. You don't go and pay the printer for the brochures and then go back to the client for the money. Never do that. So even big companies have come unstuck with that kind of thing where um, the client, you know, they've covered the cost of thousands of inserts. This is an actual job. 
uh, chats with Chase actually, whoever did the advertising for them, they had a um, huge insert, newspaper insert go in, thousands of it. Client pulled it at the last minute, wanted it redone, it was too late, it had already gone to press. They were unhappy about something, refused to pay for it, nearly sent that design agency under. Okay, because they they'd already paid for the printing. So as a, as a small business or a freelancer, you cannot afford to be forking out money for printing and then going back to the client to pay for it. So just be clear, this bit just covers your time supervising the printing process. That's it. So talking to printers, getting quotes, double checking that everything's on track, booking the job in, that would also be your job. So you talk to a printer and you ask them, what's the turnaround? I've got this job, it's needed by this date. So you go back, usually it's about two weeks before the thing is due, you go back two weeks and say, I need it by here. Um, and you give yourself plenty of time and you book it in with the printer. Um, whatever time the client wants it delivered, you want to go back two weeks to get the printing deadline. So you're setting that up at the beginning of the job once it's clear from all your discussions with the client, they've told you how many they want printed, that should all be coming out of those initial consultations with the client. So everybody's really clear what's involved, how many need to be printed, etc. So um, the other thing it says are equivalent digital processes. Well, so instead of print supervision, you might be, um, if it's a website, you might be organising a domain setup. Um, you know, uh, purchasing a word template or something for a website. So again, try and get the client to pay for those things directly rather than you forking them out. It's not as like paying for a domain up front, you might do that and then charge them for it. Um, it's not as bad as covering printing costs, but it's still, if you, you know, it's their domain, get them to pay for it directly. So if there's anything else in here, if you're setting up digital assets, then you know, whatever costs are involved, try not to cover them, try to get them to cover it directly. Um, just close these. Don't want to open. Don't need any of that. Um, so here we get down to the nitty gritty. What did you agree with them that you're going to produce? So there may be more than one item, so list them here. So you should know by right now what the items are. Everybody got your freelance job organised? You know what it is? Yep. Start filling this in. Um, so the specifications, that always just means things like what format and size. So is it a folded DL brochure? Is it an A3 poster? Is it a website banner? If so, what's its pixel dimensions? So if it's not print, if it's a digital um, asset you're creating, you know, instead of pages you would put in the exact pixel dimensions, the exact number of files they've asked for, if it's full colour or black and white or duotone and here we are, Did you, do you, you know, say for a digital banner you might be sourcing imagery from, um, you know, a, a, a proper image library and the payment for that you'd obviously need to include that as an item that's got to be either produced or sourced. So make sure that's all ready. And item two, you just repeat. So you know exactly whatever it is you've been asked to do. You, you put in each item, what's involved in it. Now by doing all of that, it will also then make it easy for you to estimate the time and then the costs. So in here, as we go down, you've also got, that's, that's why this is next. So once you've figured out exactly what it is you're going to be producing and the specifications, etc., so you fill that in and then having used your timeline already once, your timesheet, sorry, hopefully you've used the timesheet for the TAFE job so you get a sense of how long it takes you to do something um, and how long it takes you to research things, find images in a, an image library, etc., stock library, um, then you get a sense of how long it will take you for each of those tasks. So that's where you can look at these tasks, what it is you've got to do and the specifications 
and try and you know think based on your experience how many hours will it take me to do that and then put in your working days or hours and then how many working days are needed so that's your time allowance so you've got this is actually the amount of um, chargeable hours so are we talking you know you need 10 hours for this job so it might be two working days um, try and get it down to number of hours because then you can do a much better job if you work out your hourly rate then you can work out exactly what you're charging them um, so again I know at this stage you you know you're not familiar with doing this it might feel a bit strange um, but use this as a, a way to practice it so you know working days say it's a seven hour day you know if it's two days then that's 14 hours so you might put 14 hours down it's two days and maybe that's going to be spread over three or four days depending on your other work you're doing but that's how long you think it would actually actually take you so you know that's two days so you can put it in hours or in working days that's it's kind of up to you uh, what is the calendar time so how many days is it going to take for you to deliver it so is it is it two weeks or two days when do you you know don't give them false expectations here so the expected time before delivering it to them you need a week yeah maybe you think about your schedule because remember you might be doing more than one of these jobs and you might be working full-time so actually how long do you need before you get back to them with the final design is it going to all this going to take place over two weeks or two working days be realistic yes yeah, so put in here what you think yes yeah, so I need two weeks to work on this so the client will get a realistic expectation that although the project is going to take 14 hours all up and that's what they'll be charged for the actual time you need your on your calendar is two weeks or one week whatever or two days you know um, so you put something realistic in here and you could even um, you could even put in a separate time scale for each of those stages if you wanted to generally people don't generally you just put in the whole thing and then you work out your hourly rate so if your hourly rate is fifty dollars an hour and you know it's 14 hours then do your 14 hours times fifty dollars and see what you come up with the other way of working is to charge a set fee so you could have an agreed set fee um, the advantage of that is if you're working with a company and they said look this is our budget we can only pay you three hundred dollars do you agree to that and you say yeah okay then it's up to you to get it finished in time but I would try and do it you know by the hourly rate because if you do do this as a practice one you'll get a little bit more familiar well how long did it take me you know write it down on your time check sheet as you're doing the job for this freelance client realistically how long did it take me to search the image libraries for the, the ones I want how long did I spend on that if you don't record it somewhere then the next time you do a job you can't estimate how long it takes you to do that part of the job did, it, did you spend half an hour on, on looking for images or did you spend two hours there's a big difference so how long does it take you to find certain images for a particular job it's time consuming how long does it take you to send emails backwards and forwards with the client record it on your timesheet or in an app you know there's plenty of little apps out there to, that you can record your time spent on tasks um, it's up to you to find a way of recording things that suits you okay so then you work out what you think your costs will be for the whole job based on you know your hourly rate which could be anywhere from 50 to 60 70 dollars an hour depending on your your experience but you've got to start somewhere now this bit terms and in terms and conditions so this is the stuff I was talking about that's pretty good in terms of the Australian Graphic Design Association having gone through it and 
you know, you don't have to do much to this to know it's legally covering you. But that said, there's still a few things you might want to change. So, what does this mean? Commencement of work. The client agrees to provide written approval of this submission before work is commenced. Um, so once this is signed, that's when you'll start working on it. That's what that means. Okay? So it's clear to them that the moment you start work on it, that's chargeable time. Right? So once they've signed off on this, you'll start work. Not before. So you might have had some initial conversations with a client and then you're going to send them this or your adapted version of it. Um, so they're clear on what you've agreed to do and they're also clear that once they sign this, that's them saying, start work. It's not a maybe. It's not a like, oh, yeah, be nice to get a few designs off you next week. How will is that? Am I going to be paid for that? What, what's going on here? Can, can I get something off you next week? Just a, just a few ideas. And you have to think to yourself, what does that mean? Are they asking me to start work on it or not? So this makes it clear. They sign the contract. That's an agreement that you're starting work. And the charges will apply. So when you call a plumber out to your house, you don't stand there and go, oh, oh could you just have a look and tell me if it needs fixing? Oh, no, I don't want to pay you for that. Oh, well, you've call oh, I've called you out and you've come here. Oh, oh, does that cost you time, does it? Oh, do I have to pay you for that time? <laughs> so, you know, for some unknown reason, design is in this woolly grey area now because people can access the programs or they can go to one of the cheap websites and get a logo generated. It's like, oh, I could do that. You know, so those aren't the clients you want to work with, right? Maybe you'll have a few of those early on in your career when you're starting out because you need some experience. But it's also a really good experience in putting your foot down and going, this is my profession. You know, are we starting work on this, yes or no? If yes, charges start because I'll start drawing up ideas and that takes me time and I have to charge you for that time. So I think, I think we're going to get a lot of pushback. You know, now we have you know, AI generators of imagery. There's going to be a lot of this kind of rubbish that goes on. But at the end of the day, things are so specific when you're designing brochures and leaflets and for a particular job, for a particular purpose, it's very hard for that to be totally outsourced to an AI. You know, it's not really a conversation that they can have at this point with a chatbot and get what they want and then have an ongoing conversation and improve it to get exactly what they want. So um, that's all noise that's going on in the background and that's not the sort of client you want to work with. Just tell them to go back to the chat bot and do their thing, you know, you don't, you don't need them. Okay, so payment. Um, so again, the client, who is your client, put their name in here and they are agreeing to pay the invoice amount within and remember you designed an invoice, what did you put on the bottom of that? Do you want to be paid within two weeks of receiving the invoice or 30 days? Those are the usual kind of things. It's usually a fortnight after the invoice or monthly. You decide. Um, this one is if you have a very long job, say website development, a big branding campaign, something ongoing. Um, so if it's more than a month's work, if you're look like looking at a job and you think, actually, this is going to take three months, then um, the client agrees to pay by, the, by monthly payments. So you, regardless of where it's up to, you, you start invoicing for the work monthly. You don't wait to the end of three months to then invoice them, right? Um, design samples. This is You can take this out if you don't want it, but this is, and you might need to clarify this, um, you're asking them to let you have some copies of printed work uh, and you might want to amend this to having, you know, to that you want to retain high quality PDFs of the logo you designed for them for use in your portfolio. So in here you could put um, the client agrees that the designer can use 
this design in their portfolio. That's actually quite important because remember you're assigning, once you've handed over those final files, the person you've done this for basically owns the copyright of the imagery, so you need their permission to put it in your portfolio. So they, you need to put that in there somewhere, that you want to be able to use this work. So you could change the wording in that to be quite specific. Um, so it's either asking for printed samples if it's a print job. Remember, you change this to suit the actual job you're doing. So like I said, if it's a web banner, you just ask them in here. Instead of that, you delete that and say the client agrees that the designer can use all aspects of this design in their design portfolio. If they disagree with that, they'll, this is something they can come back to you and ask you to change that. It could be that they'll ask for an amendment um, and say, well, that'll be okay, but not until my product is launched. So then in here you might amend it and say, the client agrees that, that the designer can use this work um, after six months or after, after the product launch or whatever. That's not uncommon because they don't want you to launch their product on your website before it's been officially launched. Okay, so I've, I've definitely had people say, come back and say, no, no, I'm okay for you to use it, but not until two months' time or whatever it is. So think about what you want to write there because you definitely want to have permission to use stuff going forward. Some clients might say outright, no, you can't, I don't want you to use it in your portfolio. I don't, I don't want it to appear anywhere. Um, some government departments, well, all government departments, they own, the, they, you do the stuff for them, they own it, and they may not agree at all for you to use it in your portfolio. So just that's something you've got to check. All right, fees for service. So this is where um, the cost estimate um, that you've given is, is the price. That's what you both agreed on, unless there's something outside of it. Okay, so excess work is work that's not in that estimated cost of item. So if you have item one was um, a logo design, item two was the logo on a brochure plus the brochure design, you do that for them and then halfway through they go, oh, actually, we're going to, could you adjust that for a web banner? It wasn't in the contract. So you go back to them with an email and say, yes, that's fine. Uh, just letting you know that's outside of the uh, contract work, so that would be charged on the invoice as excess work. So when you do your invoice, there'll be a, another item you'll put in which just says excess work. So you'll have item one, which, you know, stage one of it, stage two, all the different things you're charging them for that you agreed to in the contract, and then an excess work one, which is, yeah, web banner, wasn't in the contract, came up halfway through the job, they suddenly realised they also need these other things. Maybe they decide, ah, oh, it'd look great on the side of my, my uh, worker's truck, so can you organise a, a truck wrap for it? It's a lot of extra work. It's not just bunging the logo on the side of the truck. You have to go and get the templates and everything of the manufacturers. Um, so that's excess work. Anything not in the contract is excess work. And there it is. Excess work is defined by any work um, additioned, not listed on that original list of items that you agreed on. Next bit is important. Uh, this is your liability that you are guaranteeing. So for the client, the stuff for this specific client, you, so it says the studio, but it's probably you, put your name in there, will be free and clear of any liens and encumbrances and maybe lawfully used. So what does that mean? It means you are guaranteeing that you are supplying them with images for which they have the copyright. You've made sure the images are copyright free. They've either been paid for properly from an image library or you've agreed to, to supply them, same with the illustrator, so that nobody's going to come back and, and sue the client 
for using them. So this is a real problem. If you pay for a photo from a stock library and you pay for limited copyright, which is that where, you know, you, you're using it but someone else can use it as well. That's the easiest way I can describe it. Um, when, you, when you do that, but then you tell the, the client, oh yes, this is, your, this is your signature image now, this coffee cup or whatever it is, this picture we've got for you, oh, you really love it, it's going on everything, it's going on the website, it's going on everywhere. The client thinks that they've got exclusive rights to it and their competitor won't have it. Or worse, the photographer comes back and goes, hang on, you paid for a limited licence on this, so I can still sell this image to other people. Um, and hang on, you've been using, you know, this company's now using my photo as a signature image all around the world and I didn't get paid for it. So it's the designer's job to make sure that the copyright status of the imagery you supply, that you know exactly what that is and that's explained to the client. And so that's why, you know, if, if the imagery is really important to them, you want to make sure that they're happy to pay for the exclusive rights over the image and you need, it's your job to explain to them what that means. Yeah, if they want those images, yeah, okay, you want these images to be exclusive to you? For this childcare centre, you don't mind if the childcare centre down the road uses the same images? Is that okay with you? Oh, it's not. Okay, then we have to pay more. We have to pay for exclusivity for these images because they're important to you. So they're not generic, you know, and someone else can use them. So you need to be very clear about this because um, it's all. that's what this is all about. It's about making sure and you are, you, by supplying them to the client, you are responsible, you are liable for any mistakes with copyright that are made. Super important that you understand this. Yep, got a question? So you, like, you, know, you approach them and you say, like, oh, yeah, if you want this exclusively, you pay more, they're like, no, that's fine. We'll take like the limited amount or whatever. Yeah. And then you, know, you sort of finish the job. Then down the track, they get sued by someone because they're using it the wrong way and assuming like, you're, just, you're not liable. Right. Well, that's where you could even tighten this even more. You could state specifically the number of images for this job have been supplied and, you know, in here you could make a little statement that such and such images have been supplied and have uh, limited copyright and that the client understands. So in here you could say it is agreed that the photos 1 to 10 are uh, um, limited copyright and can be used by others um, and the client understands that and that photos 5, 6 and 7 have exclusive copyright and can't be used by anyone else and the client is paid for those. You can make this very specific. Okay, it's, that's why I'm talking to you about it because every time you do a contract there are going to be different things each time that could be problematic and all you have to do is go into this contract and just adapt it to be more specific so you make sure you're covered. So if you suspect, you know, that these images might cause a problem further down the track, try to head it off, try to encourage them to pay the extra for exclusive use. If they won't, then as long as you've put something in here to cover yourself, then you can't be sued because you've put it in the contract. Yeah, that the client understands that images A, B, C, D, have limited um, copyright only, whereas images, you know, C, D, and F, e, and F have full copyright. So you can make this as detailed as you like okay. to protect yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's all about protecting you, you know, because at the end of the day, you have to take responsibility for the stuff you supply the client with. However, the client um, also has to agree, if you look at the, the next the next couple of things, um, if the client is supplying you with imagery and this exact thing, is, I think I talked about before, exact thing happened to me. If they're supplying the images, 
you can put in a line here also that the client agrees that any materials they supply are copyright free and um, the design agrees that the designer is not liable for the images provided by the client. So I think I gave you the example again, it was a childcare centre, they supplied me with all these images. They just taken happy snaps of kids in their centre. Yeah, and they and I said to them straight away, I said, Did you did you get the parents' consent? Did you is there a model sign off? So there should be a signed signed contract saying permission was given for these photos, you know, it's it's a contract. No, oh no, we just took these photos in the playground and, and I had to explain to them that I couldn't use a single one of those photos and that they needed to pay for images from an image library. And that's what we did. We swapped everything over. But they would have totally have used them. Now, you know, if you didn't have it in the contract here that the client is also responsible for making sure that the images are copyright free, yes, you could get into a mess. Now, I, I didn't need to put it in the contract in the end because I headed off the problem and didn't use any images they supplied. But if a client comes to you with a whole bunch of images, just question where are these coming from. And the same with the text. If they're giving you a whole bunch of copy for a brochure, just ask the question, oh, is this copyright by you? Is, where did this come from? Yeah, or at least if, if, if you can't find out anything, just put a line in here that says the client also agrees that the material they've supplied is free, and you just use the same thing, free of all liens and encumbrances, and may be lawfully used by the designer. <coughs> so you just add another sentence in here. And you can put it in, just put it in plain English, put it the way you understand it, reword it totally so that you understand it, they understand it. Um, because uh, it's, it's about copyright, um, and trademarks as well. So again, just making sure that they're not supplying you with anything that's not lawful. Okay, next bit, we're moving on to copyright. So this is where you can play around with the copyright a little bit, but basically this is a standard thing. By them paying you for the job, you're agreeing that the client will have the exclusive right to retain and reproduce any of the stuff you've produced. Right? So you've handed over your copyright to them, which is why you had to put in there that you'd like permission to use it in your portfolio, etc. So that's why you need to actually state that, because you've basically they've bought it off you the same way they're buying the images from the library. They now have the right to reproduce it. And what that means is you also don't have the right to use that design with a different client. So you've got to think about that carefully. You could change it so that it's not an exclusive right and see whether they're okay with it. That could be in the, in the form of something like um, a manual or some kind of, uh, sorry, forms or something that you've designed and it's a, a great template and you want to use it somewhere else. So if that was the case, you might adapt that and say, it's agreed that the um, client will have exclusive right to retain and reproduce and then you specifically name the things that would have um, the outlined work that would have that exclusive right and then with their agreement you say um, it's agreed that um, there's only um, partial copyright for, there's limited copyright for the um, templates because you wish to use them with another client. It's just a template, it's a format. So that's the kind of thing you can be, again, more specific. But this is a good generic, um, if you're just doing a normal job, this is a really good generic one and you can just swap in the name of your client. Um, yep, so you're assigning to the client all rights, title and interest in the future copyright of any artwork, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so it's whatever's in that outline of work. Whatever's in that, that outline, those items, that's what's covered and that's the copyright you're handing over and stuff for. 
Okay, the next line's important as well, and you usually would leave it in. The granting of copyright does not extend to the use of any design proposals submitted but not approved by the client. So that is really important because if you've sent the client three or four different design ideas and maybe they pull out of the job. Again, this is unfortunately a true story, not to me, but I've had a couple of students have this happen. They've sent three or four different designs to someone and that person's gone, actually I've changed my mind, thanks very much, I'll pay you for the design development but I'm not going to use that. Six months later, it turns up. I think it was Ada. She said that happened to her, actually. That was a recent one. But I've had quite a few people this has right. happened to. <laughs> yes, so they've taken the proposed design, not paid you for it, and then used it. Or, or it could be that you've gone ahead with one design, that's all happened, design job's over and done, you've been paid, and then six months later, 12 months later, you see this design which was just one of the ideas, and they're using it. They didn't pay you for that. That wasn't the agreement. So this is actually a very important sentence. Um, when I was first starting out, I did a lot of illustration work for a lot of fantasy drawings and stuff like that, and um, I signed a contract that didn't have this in it. I had no idea. I was like 17 or something, and I was so excited to be selling some illustrations. And um, yeah, so it went ahead, this book on mythology was printed and I thought that was the end of it. About, I don't know how many years later, but years and years later, I walked into a kid's bookshop. I was looking for a book for a friend's child and I see this other book and I see my illustrations. But I'd handed over complete copyright without understanding. So there was no recourse. So I fished around and found the original book. <laughs> no, I was horrified. I was, I was cracking book too. It was like, and it had a mishmash of, a mishmash of design styles all over it, like illustration styles. So it was actually not something you'd be proud of because they looked awful jammed together on the same page. Different illustrators had done, they just cut and pasted them in. So awful. And I was just like, oh gosh, that's what happens if you sign a contract um, and don't, don't read it. You know, but like, hey, I was 17, I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> so they outright owned those illustrations so they could do anything they liked with them. Yep, so if I'd been a bit older and smarter, I would have read, actually read the contract. <laughs> so confidentiality, so this is also important. And again, this is standard. So basically, the importance of that is um, you don't go and paste post something on Facebook about the job you're doing or on Instagram while you're doing it. So that would actually be breaking confidentiality. So that's something you need to think about that maybe, you know, in previous generations designers didn't have to think. But you might be in the habit of posting, yeah, you might be in the habit of posting socially about what you're working in. You can't do that um, until the job is over and you've had, a, you know, it's in there. You have permission to do that. So um, it also comes into when um, a company hasn't launched a product yet and they don't want their competitor. It's actually quite important that it doesn't get out into the public domain before it's meant to. Okay, and like we've often had designers come in here and showcase their work. Hey guys, I'm actually recording this, so you're mumbling in the background. Um, it's, it's, we've had designers come in and show students work and... The students have asked, oh, I didn't see that on your website. And the design um, speaker said, that's because it's under confidentiality. I'm showing it to you, but it's not to be published anywhere yet. Yes, it's not on my website. It's not out there in the world. Okay, so you just have to respect that. Is that a Sorry? Is that a as long as you don't have to you can actually show it on top of well, I guess because it wasn't being reproduced, it was just being shown in class, but then he also, the speaker on that day, also said, no, no photos, no filming. Yeah. I'll show you this on the condition that nobody's filming it or photographing it. So he made it pretty clear we were getting special showing because he was trying to show the design process behind it. But it was a current project, it was a current, um, which was really exciting for students to see, but no one was allowed to use their phones or, or make a recording of it. So I guess he covered himself that way. 
Okay, litigation, blah, blah, blah. Um, that is just a typical thing about, you know, people falling over as they walk in your door, basically. So, um, yeah, injury or death or damage to property. Um, it just should be in there, yeah? So you're covered if you leave that in there. Amendments to these terms and conditions. Although, just on that, um, you want to make sure if you're doing an internship that it's done properly. Uh, they should have cover for you as you go in there. That's the same reason why it's very difficult to get free work experience because if you go on the premises somewhere and they're not covered by insurance. Similar to TAFE, if you're not enrolled, you shouldn't be on the premises because you're not covered by TAFE insurance. It's a very similar thing for all workplaces. So um, some students have gone and got their own insurance Liability yeah, public liabilities, so they could do some work experience, but it's not cheap, right? If it's part of a course you're doing, if we had work placement in here, you would be covered by TAFE. Unfortunately, work placement isn't in the curriculum. I wish it was. So that means we can't cover you if you're doing some work experience, so you have to organise your own liability. Uh, but that's just a general thing, should stay in the amendments. So this is important too. Um, the client might want to change some of the things you send in the contract, right? They have to agree to it. They may disagree with some things in there and come back to you and say, no, no, actually, like particularly about the um, giving permission for you to use it, they may have some conditions around it. Um, or they might want to clarify what this copyright thing is about. Um, but it's a good opportunity to have a, a chat, you know, further if there's anything that comes up out of this that they're not sure about and you can explain to them what it means like excess work is a special one it's really good for them to understand that they've agreed to this this um, this is this list of items this is what they've agreed to anything that's not on that list is excess work right as long as they're clear on that doesn't mean you won't do excess work but it will be charged separately to what's in this contract so if this contract your estimate you know, you've estimated, you know, a couple of thousand dollars and then they come back and ask you to do some, you know, web banner or something, um, you know, that will be an excess charge. It's not going to come under what your estimate was here. So that's, that's it. Then you send it to them, you get them to sign it and send it back and just go through the motions, even if you're not being paid for it. Go through the motions, charge your friends 60 bucks an hour, even if they're not paying you. Reassure them that they don't have to pay you, but still go through the motions of sending them this contract. You go through and prepare it, and then you hand in the signed contract, submit it to the Moodle. Okay, so that's taken about as long as I thought it would to go through. So hopefully you've gotten underway with it, and you need to finish that that off. Um, so have a little bit of a break, and then I'm going to come. I'm going to have a cup of tea, and I come back, and we're going to do the business plan. So the game of the business plan, I recommend you try to do it with me because then it's done. You know, you don't have to agonise over it. So are there any questions before I stop? Are there any more questions about it? Is it kind of clear what you're doing? Do have a look. Like I on the Moodle, like I said, I've, I've put some examples of other students' um, ones. I've put Ryan's there, but I think I've got a couple of other ones on there as well. So... You can see, you can have a look at the way he reworded it. So that's not bad. Like he's kept the same thing, but you can see he's reworded it and he's reduced down. Everything's gone except the actual things that he's going to be working on. Right? And you've got the stages of work, the actual work, the outline of work. So it's not doesn't look nearly as overwhelming as the original document. So only keep in the things that apply. Uh, I've had students just hand in that document with just the names changed. You go, but hang on, you didn't produce the working dummy. You didn't do all these things. That's not what we mean by preparing a, a contract. So, you, you know, it's something that goes to the client. So, again, you might want to put your branding on it because it is a client. Anything that's client-facing, like your timesheet's just for you, so you don't need to brand that necessarily. Um, but anything that's client-facing, you should use your logo, etc., because you're going to send it to them. The same with the invoice. So
So whatever design you've done in your invoice, just, you know, put that on the actual contract as well. Oh yeah, here's another one. Uh, this is Chris's one. And look, his stages of work, his is, it's really simple. Initial consultation, client meeting and discussion of brief. That was his initial consultation. Um, so he's kept it pretty simple. Look, revisions. You have three rounds of revisions available. He's kept print production in and web production. So he must have been doing some print and web for his freelance one. And here's what he had to produce. And you can see the specifications, item two. And then there's his time and costs, charge number 1,000. And note in here, print expenses to be paid directly by the client. Like he's, he's added it in the bottom of that list to make it doubly clear that he's not going to be paying the printer. Make that super clear. And then this is standard. So generally, if you did decide to pay for... Say you decided to, you would pay for the stock images up front, you then can charge an extra 10% on top of that. So you'll pay for the photos, but then you charge an extra 10% for your time and expertise in getting them. So that usually puts the clients off, you know, and they usually, when they see that, they're usually happy to pay for whatever you say for the actual stock images. Uh, then the terms of conditions, you can see he's made it pretty, just, just exactly the same as on the contract, just some slight changes. So with those terms and conditions, you, sh you shouldn't need to change them very much. It's just a few things you might specify, but also obviously you've got to put in the name of the company instead. So you've got these two models you can look at. So if you want to see how to simplify it, have a look at Ryan's one. It's pretty good. Or Chris's one. And you can see both of them have kept the terms and conditions pretty much unchanged because you need those. Okay, see how you go. I'll go have a cup of tea and I'll come back. Stop recording this.